So ideally, when you come to this class, you've already got your own website. For example, this client at kiestexcoco.com. Hopefully, you've already got your own website. If you don't, that's okay. But ideally, I would like it when people come to this class, they've already got a website and they've already got their blog on their website. That's my perfect world. But as we see, most of the time that doesn't pan out. That's okay. So what we're going to do is we're going to talk about creating a free WordPress website to use as our blog. So sometimes the question is, well, what's the difference between a blog and a website? In one sense, in a technical sense, there is a difference. But in a practical sense, I wouldn't say there's much of a difference between a blog and a website. Yes, a blog is going to be published on a regular basis and such, but it's still a website. And it's going to be your website where you're going to sell your products or whatever, but you're still going to have a blog. So in a sense, for us, it's interchangeable enough. On a technical level, they're different, but we're not going to worry about it. So the point is, we're going to create a WordPress website that has a blog. If you've already got your own, you can use it, no problem. But if you'd like to create this free one that I'm going to show you, you can do that as well. This website right here, and almost every website that my company does for clients, is made in WordPress. So that's why I'm also saying it's pretty interchangeable still, because this whole website is WordPress. And you might think, well, I thought only WordPress was for blogging. WordPress can do both. They can make a, a blog website, and it can make a website website. And that's what this one is. It's WordPress with a blog. Um, my own company's website, pmdinteractive.com. Also, this one is a WordPress site that has a blog. So you can use WordPress to do any one of those kinds of of sites. So you see. I need to have it. Website, mm -hmm. but then how do you get that domain name? That's one of the things we'll be addressing because uh, you're not going to get the name automatically. So we'll get to that. Yes. Yeah, I was going to ask about the domain name as well. Yes, that's a question people always have because notice these sites that I'm showing, these have their own domain name. The way I'm going to show you, you're going to have, for example, my site dot wordpress dot com instead of mysite.com. Well, for free, this is a good trade-off, just to learn this. Ideally, you're going to want mysite.com, but you can't get that for free. You can get the mysite.wordpress.com for free, and I'll show you that. And then if you'd like to later, you can upgrade it, and I'll show you the prices. But these over here that have their own domain name, with the name that they want exactly how they want, those are not free. And again, I'll show you those prices. We'll talk prices in a little bit. It's not that expensive, but it's not free. So if you don't have it open, go ahead and open your web browser. Open any of your favorite web browsers. And let's go to the website wordpress.org. .org. Wordpress.org. Wordpress.org is where you would see a variety of useful information. It's basically the manual of how to use WordPress. There are others, other books and such, that are written a little bit more user-friendly, but this is the whole manual to WordPress. This is also where you can go to get support. If your site is broken and such, you can go in there to the support forum and ask a question, and Word, official WordPress people will help, and even members of the community. So everything about WordPress is found here. More importantly, the support stuff. The forums and the documentation, the manual. You don't create your website here, because notice it says download WordPress. You can download the WordPress software. It's completely free. The WordPress software itself is free, but not the domain name and the hosting. I'll explain those in a little bit. But it's like if you're trying to um, edit graphics, if you've got some photos and you want to edit them, what's the big famous software to edit photos? Photoshop. That's not free. It's several hundred dollars. Software to edit the photos. The WordPress software, which is to create a website or a blog, is completely free. 
The trick is you need to install it on a server, on your own domain, on your own website, your own .com, .net, whatever. So here at WordPress.org, you can download the software and install it. That's a little technical. So that's why there's WordPress.com. Let's go now to WordPress.com. At WordPress.com, the purpose of this site here is to create your new website for free. That's what we're going to do. The big downside is the default will be victorsdesigns.wordpress.com instead of victorsdesigns.com. We can pay to upgrade it. We'll see that later. But I just want us together, we will create a website here on WordPress, and then everyone will have a WordPress site and then we can talk about how to use WordPress effectively. If you've got your own site that is WordPress, use it. If you've got your own site that is not WordPress, use it. Or you can use this one that we're going to create together. Yes? So when you build it on, on the .com site, and if you want your own address, you have to purchase it through them. And if you have your own hosting, you use the .org download? You could purchase your domain and such from them, but honestly, I don't think it's worth it. It's a little too expensive for what they give you. Um, you could start your site here and then transfer it over to your own self-hosted site. And we'll talk about those details, but like but just just just, like just one. Let, let me finish answering this question. But the the thing is, you want to uh, in the long term get the uh, get the domain yourself. This one is just training wheels, and I'll explain the difference in a bit. Question? Uh, I was going to say, isn't there just one international organization that gives out those domain names? Technically there is, but you can buy through a middleman for a variety of prices, which, which we'll look at. But that's getting a little ahead of ourselves, so right now let's create a site here. Once again, if you've got your own uh, WordPress site, log into it. If not, I'm going to show you here about creating a site. Click Create Website. Right away it says, okay, create your site, something something.wordpress.com. You can make this up however you want. You can make it real, you can make it fake, you can delete it later, maybe just to learn this, make up anything you want. The Victor Campos blog. Is that available? Yes, it seems to be available. If it's not available, it'll let you know. Someone might have beat you to the punch. Website has been, uh, WordPress has been around, I think, a decade now. So if you haven't really heard about it until recently, it's been around several years. In the in the world of the web, ten years, eight years is a long time. The web itself is twenty five years old. The internet is older, but the web, which we visit on a web browser, is younger, but it's 25 years old. So that name that you thought, that amazing name that your company is, that has had for a couple generations family business, it might have been taken by someone else. So uh, put in some name. This can be changed also if you want to. But I'm going to add a name and then click Create Your Site and Continue. It's telling me that my address is going to be the Victor Campos blog .wordpress com. It'll ask you for some details here and email. This is for you to add your current email, your current Hotmail, Gmail, Yahoo Mail, whatever you have. This is not to create a new email. This is for your current email because it'll want to verify you so that you can have all of the features of WordPress. So if you can't have access to your own email at the moment, you might be stuck. Yes? Can you purchase a domain already? We'd like to use that on the free version. Um, that, that's what we'll look at a little bit later, but in, in short, you're going to install WordPress on your domain through your provider, which I'll talk about how to do a little bit later. But we cannot install this onto your 
currently existing one just yet. They're kind of separate for the moment. So either uh, I would wait to see how to do that on yours, or do this, and once you learn it, we can transfer this over to your existing one. You know, I, I just like said I put in my actual real email address, mm -hmm. but then when I put in uh, the username, it said, sorry, that username already exists, but if it's my email address, it should exist. Yeah. No, they're two separate things. What it's asking you is, on this username, I would recommend use the same name that you wrote for the address. Oh, okay. The, the, the Victor Campos blog in my case. So whatever you wrote for your address, write it for your username, that should work better. And now it's telling me that you So add, add an existing email, your username, could be anything, but I recommend they make this a little confusing. I, I don't think they had this before. I don't know why they do it now, but you could have your username different than your web address. And, use, and they used to link your web address the same as your username, causing no problems. But now they're separate, so what I would recommend, just write your username and your web address the same. And then write a password, and any of these things can be changed later. I'll fill those in and click next. And here's where the upsell comes in, the upsell. They're saying, okay, you're currently going to have victorsblog.wordpress.com. Wouldn't you like victorsblog.com? So here's where they're saying, okay, you can get the victorcomposblog.com for $18 per year. The victorcomposblog.me for $25. The Victor Campos blog.net for $18 a year. I do not recommend you buy any of these. WordPress.com will sell you a domain name, but these prices are more expensive than when you can get them at other reputable locations. And this is not the full price, really, of, of a full website. This is just a domain name. A website is really made out of two things the domain name and the hosting. The domain, like a house, is the street address. And the hosting is the actual house, the stuff at the location. So victor.com, that's the domain name, but the pictures that I've got there and the blog that I've written and my video, that's the hosting. You have to buy both of those. And here they're only saying that they're selling the, the domain and on another screen they'll sell you the hosting and then you'll get some sticker shock. Because on other websites that I'll mention later, you can get a much fuller featured product for, the, for a much better price than what they're selling here. So on this screen, I would just skip it, click no thanks. The great thing about WordPress is that it's very customizable. You can write your blog posts and your about page and you can add your products and all that great stuff and then every few months decide I'm gonna change the look of my site, I'm gonna change the style, I'm gonna change the theme and so everything that I've added to the site automatically transfers over to the new design literally with the click of a couple of buttons if you were using classic web design software like Dreamweaver it's very hard to change your theme from one design to another a modern platform like WordPress is, could be as easy as a click of one or two buttons. Those are known as the themes. And here it says, here's a few themes to choose from. Boardwalk, Cubic, Edmund, etc. You may run into one or two that maybe say premium. You can also pay for... Pay for um, themes. Pay for the design of your website. So go ahead and take a moment there to, if you like any one of those, go ahead and click. 
and then you can click at the bottom to next step. So take a moment to pick. This can always be changed, of course. So if you find one that you like, you can uh, pick it. You can always change it later, but I'm going to go with, I don't know, I'm going to go with Minnow. You can hover on one and click it. And then when you click it, and then when you click it, it comes over to a screen where here's another up upsell. So we have WordPress.com, the free version, free for life, so you can start using it and have it totally free forever. The thing is that you've got the, the WordPress name attached to your site. Well, if you bought the, the domain name, then that's done. But then, as I said, there's domain and there's hosting. The domain is just the name of your site. The hosting is where you store your pictures and your text and your videos. And look at these prices, $99 per year. So $20 for the name, $99 for the hosting, and then you've got premium and business. The difference with business is then you'll be able to sell products. So that's over $300 a year to sell something here. That's way overpriced in my opinion. I've been doing this since about 2001. This is very overpriced. You can get better comparable and better results if you go to these other companies that I'll mention later. For $300, you can buy all of this for five years. And here in WordPress, they're selling it for one year. So it's very convenient. There's a lot of training wheels here, and maybe we need it. But uh, really, if we go with uh, one of these other reputable companies I'll mention, you're going to save a lot of money and get better results. So you can pick anything you want here, but I'm recommending the free one. Select the three. At the top of the screen, it tells me to verify my email. I don't have to do it just yet, but if I want to eventually publish my hosts for the world to, to see, I need to verify my address. You don't quite need to do it yet, but maybe by the next break, you can do so. Let me just confirm here. Did everyone get to the screen where it says thanks for signing up? Does anyone need a little help at this point? So I forgot to say at the beginning of the day, usually the way I run my class is that during the main lecture I'm always happy to help. Raise your hand, ask a question, I'll help you out. If you fall one or two steps behind, call me over, I'll help you. If you fall three or four or five steps behind, maybe wait for the break. We usually have about a 10-minute break every hour or so. If you're falling 10 or 12 steps behind, you might wait till the end of the day. At the end of the day, I usually have about 30 minutes of open lab time for more individual help. So there's plenty of opportunity to get help by me. Or if you want to help your neighbors, that's great. The only thing that I ask is that you keep it down a bit, because sound travels, and uh, you might be interrupting your neighbor who's trying to listen into the lecture. So in any event, always raise your hand and I'll, and I'll help you out. One of the confusing things about WordPress is that it's pretty powerful, but there's a lot of screens to look at. When you go home and you want to log back in to keep working on this, you're going to go back to WordPress.com. And then you're going to select to log in. You're not going to create another website. You're going to click <coughs> log in at home. We're currently logged in, so the screen looks like this. And there's our first confusion. Where do I go to write my blogs? Where do I go to check my traffic? What pages were, were hot? Where do I go for that? Well, it's up on the top left, my site. So hopefully you see that My Site link. Go ahead and click it. You can have multiple blogs here, all for free. I could have one account that I've created and add more WordPress blogs. We've got one because we just created one. We get this screen that 
is helpful, but again, I think it's too much of training wheels. And if you choose to, to, to get a book on WordPress or to read tutorials on WordPress, they almost never deal with the screen. So I'm not going to talk about it very much. I'm going to talk about the screen that every tutorial tells you about and every uh, book tells you about and what I usually teach. I'm going to talk about, we're going to get away from the screen as soon as we can, and we're going to go into this WP Admin screen. Do you see WP Admin? Right there, go ahead and click on that. It takes us out of the training wheels and onto the real bike. So click on WP Admin. And now on the left side, we've got all of this control, all of this ability and power to actually use WordPress. And you'll be able to use like 95% of every feature of WordPress here. That last 5% is actually very important, and we can't, we cannot use it at WordPress.com. That last feature is a, is a menu item that is not even available here called plugins. Plugins are extra little apps, extra little features that add more power to your WordPress site. Like, I want to sell products, that's a plugin. I want to have more advanced forums, that's a plugin. I want to add really cool slideshows, chat features. I've seen plugins that give you the ability that when someone visits your site, they will see on the corner, ask tech support, and if they click it, it'll contact you right away to answer someone's tech support question on the spot. That's a plugin. Those advanced features are not available to us on WordPress.com. That's why, as I'll talk about later, you want to get your website at godaddy.com, bluehost.com, hostgator.com. I'll mention them all again. But you want to get them at a reputable internet or domain provider, and then you'll have the plugins feature. All of those sites that I mentioned earlier today, they went to one of those three or four that I mentioned. So I'm going to mention them because I've used them for real clients, not because they give me a kickback. They don't. But I mention them because I've used them for real clients. But for us, this is enough. The free version of WordPress that doesn't have that one big feature. We're going to get acclimated a little bit because some of us don't have any experience in WordPress. But again, in the syllabus, I mentioned a very good book to look at regarding blogging. And I'll mention another very good book that focuses on WordPress. Visual Quick Start Guide for WordPress. You want to get the one, the newest edition, which I, it's one of these two, I think this one. It's got a little bunny and a red background. Those are the old ones. But the Visual Quick Start Guide for WordPress are very good, very readable books, relatively short, pretty inexpensive. $21, and they will really guide you on all the basics and intermediate aspects of WordPress, more than we can get to in this class. Even if you take my four-week version of the class, there's still always something to learn. And these books are very good. So I wouldn't get the old ones. That's WordPress 1, WordPress 2, and these are WordPress 3 and 4. But I would get the newest edition if I can find it. Are you saying one or the other, or you would read both as one uh, an advanced version? Ah, oh, that's a good point. Uh, I can't see from the thumbnail, but I think it's you know one is one is the, the 2012 edition and one is the 2015 oh, edition. Oh, the same material though. It's not that one is uh, you know, more <coughs> rudimentary and the other is advanced. Well, actually, they do add to the book every time they update it, so I would still try to get the latest one. Don't worry about the older ones, just get the latest one. Even though this one costs $1.99, I wouldn't get it because I think it's a little too old. It wouldn't have the newest features. But in any event, let's acclimate ourselves a little bit to this WordPress dashboard. One of the big ideas is we've got the dashboard also known as the back end or the control panel, the dashboard. 
which is what only you see as the owner of this block. I want to see what regular people see, visitors to my site. That would be the front end, what the regular user sees. To switch back and forth, at the very top left we see my site, and if you hover over it, if you hover your mouse over it, you will see View Site. So if you click View Site, then we go to the front end. This is what it looks like to people, except that they won't see that bar at the top because we're logged in. Um, we only see that because we were an administrator to the blog, this top gr uh, dark gray bar. Only we see it. But this is what my site looks like. Yours might look different, of course. You chose a different theme. That's okay. But this is what it looks like for people. I want to go back to the dashboard to add a blog post or edit. So again, you hover over my site and then you select WP Admin. So we're going to get used to that. If I say, let's go to the front end, that means you go to visit site or view site. If I say, let's go to the back end, that means go to WP Admin. Front end, back end, dashboard, main site, different terms, basically the, the control panel and the visible site. Let's jump down uh, first to set a couple of settings uh, that I think are important and then we'll add a blog post. <coughs> if you hover over at the very bottom, you've got settings. You've got various settings to work with. Hover over settings and then select general. Question? All right, so let's go to the general screen and we'll look at some important things here. for the moment. All right, so under the general settings here, notice that the site title is that weird name. You can change this. This is what appears to people on the front end. A moment ago when I showed uh, my, my site, it showed right here, the Victor Campos blog. That doesn't look quite right. So you can take a moment to, to update your site title there. That's the text that appears on your home page. And it's also going to appear up on the tab or the title of your, of your site. So one thing about SEO, search engine optimization, is to develop a keyword strategy. The search engines want to show your website to the interested people, but they won't know that until you provide them a variety of clues. And one of the clues is using keywords, what your site is about, what your content is. So in the SEO class, we go into more detail because you can over-optimize your site, unfortunately, and that'll bring you down. So, you know, it's like a needy person in a relationship. Eventually, they go over the edge, and it's not good. So what you're doing here is you don't want to go over the edge with SEO. Um, so for the site title, you might think, okay, great. This is my website about my blog. Let's say my blog is I'm going to be um, selling my paintings. So I'm going to be writing about my paintings to entice people to buy the paintings. So over-optimization would be writing up on the title here, for example, paintings, watercolor, abstract. This is not the best place to write those keywords. We'll talk about other places to do so. This would be a title of your site as you want it to be known. Um, 
because when someone searches, this is what's going to pop up on the search results. And on my particular site, that it makes sense just by that name, I then have a secondary uh, item of a tagline, which could be very important if you've got a title that is not so specific like that. Victor's blog. What is this blog about? I don't know. So then definitely the tagline. One sentence. They say a few words, but I'm going to say one sentence. Because here I think it sounds too much like put your keywords in. No. Again, you're going to write regular human words, human sentences, not for the search engines. You're going to write one sentence that explains what your site is about with a keyword or two. So if I was, if my site was Victor's blog, I would say uh, handmade um, watercolor artwork. I'm putting in some of those keywords. Watercolor, artwork, handmade, whatever makes sense for my particular site. That's going to go toward optimizing your site for SEO. Yes? So this is not necessarily your business tagline. This is just your tagline. Well, this might be linked. Ideally, your business tagline is also optimized. But perhaps we set that up before we thought of anything of SEO. That's okay. You then have to decide, does your business tagline make enough sense to use it as an SEO tagline? If it doesn't, you might want to recraft it a little bit or replace it. But we're going to start to think about what are some keywords and concepts that I could add to my site to help me get found. So you could put a placeholder in and then change it to something that's more attractive in the future. Definitely. So it's better to have something than nothing because you're already telling the search engine something instead of nothing. And that could be edited anytime we want, of course. Time zone. Are we at UTC zero? First of all, where in the world is UTC zero? Greenwich Mean. Greenwich Mean Time. London. We're not in London today. What's our um, what's our UT UTC <coughs> offset? Zero. Depending on the time of year. So forget that and just look up Los Angeles. So if you click on it and just start typing LOS, it should jump you to Los Angeles instead of scrolling through the 200 cities it has here. Let's just find Los Angeles. That's the right time zone. Like I said, click on it and then type LOS, and then it'll jump you to Los Angeles. Then we've got here the date. How would you like to present your date? doesn't matter how you do that. You can choose whatever you'd like for the date, time zone, the date format, I mean. Setting your proper time zone is important because then you, uh, you're you publishing content and it says, oh, this keeps being published at 3 in the morning. Why is that? Or maybe you schedule blog posts and they're coming at the wrong time. So set your correct time zone. Time format, you can change that as well. I'm fine with that. Week starts on Monday, that's fine. You could put Sunday, doesn't matter. What language is your blog primarily written in? If it's primarily in English, English. If you've got English, Spanish, Italian, Hebrew, Japanese, etc. That's the main language of your blog posts. So on the time format, I didn't change it. This is fine here. That's an example of what the what it looks like, not what it really is now. I don't know. That's why I'm not bothering with it. If you'd like to change your site so that the menus are in Spanish or Italian and such. That's on a different screen. This is to set what the content of your text is. So if you make any changes here, remember to click at the bottom, Save Changes. I won't do it just yet because I don't have one but it's a good idea to add a blog picture. It's on the top right. 
that will identify and brand your content uh, throughout different websites. So I don't have a picture to upload, but at some point you could upload a picture. Uh, I'm not going to look at all of these settings, just a few important ones. Let's skip over here to reading. So under the settings, uh, let's skip to reading. We won't have a lot of time to get into it because this is our blogging class after all, but if you take some of my other classes, we use Word, we can use WordPress as a classic blog site or as a more modern static page, and that's simply Let me show you this other client. They also have a, a WordPress site. There's another restaurant. This is Italian food this time. And they've got a WordPress site that is known as a static site in that the home page doesn't change that often. Now we have a slow network at this campus, so it's coming up slowly, but Still not coming up. Okay, I'll show you both aspects. This is the opposite side. This is a classic blog style in that the, the latest um, blog post appears on the home page and it pushes down the old blog posts below it. So as we add new blog posts, it pushes the old ones down. So that's the classic blog platform. Um, that's the default of what we get in WordPress, which is saying right here, my front page will display my latest blog post. I don't know why that one is not loading up, but I'll show a different example, Elsa Valencia. This one is an example of the static home page. Not literally static in that there's no motion. There's obviously motion from the slideshow. But the home page does not change. The newest blog post does not push down an older blog post. There's no blog post on the home page. So that's the other option, but that takes a little more setup. A static page. That takes the setup of choosing. What's the front page that we're going to show? And where are we going to show our blog posts? We're not quite going to get into setting that up because we're focusing on the blog in this class. But if you'd like to learn more, this is the screen where to change it. And if you click on that link, it'll take you back to the WordPress manual and it'll explain it in detail. We have how many, uh, how many blog pages, uh, how many posts would you like to show on the home page or on the blog page at a time? So here it's showing, it's saying show 10, and then a button that says page 2, then 10 more, and then page 3. It'll automatically create your pages for you. You can choose whatever number you want here. There's no big effect on SEO unless you've got a lot of blog posts with a lot of pictures because that could slow down your site and then the search engines will penalize you for a slow site. So lots of pictures that load up at once could slow you down and a slow site could penalize your SEO. So perhaps if you take it down to four posts at a time, you're going to show enough content on the home screen but not so much that it overloads and slows down people's downloads. These next two are related to subscriptions. A feed is when someone subscribes to your blog. This is built in. Someone can subscribe to your blog. On uh, older methods of making websites, you had to program that in. It was kind of complicated. Here you can have people subscribe to your blog right away. And then so the option is, when you publish a new post, would you like people in their mail inbox to get the full blog post or a summary of it? I would recommend the summary because if they read, if they get the whole thing in their inbox, they have no point to come back to your site. 
if you give them a snippet, the summary, they'll read a little bit of it, and if they're interested, they'll click read more, they come back to your site, they read the whole thing, maybe they read another blog post, maybe then they buy or hire your services or whatever. But if, they, if there's the dead end of, your, of, your, of that inbox, their mail inbox, their Gmail inbox, that's it. Why would they come back to your site unless they're really compelled? So I recommend summary. Does that mean you, then you need to write a summary and the full text, or, or does the, some algorithm do a summary for you? We're going to choose the summary. Out of our main full text, we will pick the summary. I guess I don't understand about the syndication of 10 items versus... That, that's what I was about to, to say. This related to the summary when someone subscribes to you, how many do you want them to see in their inbox? Ten at a time, two at a time, five at a time. On that one, you, you should think about it in terms of overwhelming your, your user's inbox. If they subscribe and suddenly they get ten emails from you in a short time, they're going to think spam site. So perhaps if that's also low or modest, like three or two or four, then they'll get a few <coughs> mails from you, and then uh, not you won't scare them away. That suddenly your inbox got flooded. Then we've got site visibility. You have to decide what you want to do here, but in the real world, I would leave this first one on. Allow the search engines to find my site. Of course, I want... Yahoo and Google and Bing and AOL and all of them to find my site. But maybe I'm just taking this for a test spin. Maybe yeah, this is not really a real site. Maybe it's still a work in progress. I can then change it to discourage search engines. Notice the caveat. Neither, the, neither of these options block access to your site. The site is still visible. It's just that the search engines might not find it. If you, however, want no one to see it without special access, then you would set it to private. Why would somebody discourage search engines? Well, if you're currently testing the site and writing a few things but don't really want it to be found yet, maybe these are your training wheels and you're still learning it and you don't want it to be public just yet by the search engines, you could discourage search engines. So, Question. and then the private, would that be where you just want a certain circle of, of people that have a common interest to see it? Is that the purpose of that one, that third one? Exactly. So you could have private subscribers or you could sell access. Definitely. That's to keep it private so only close people or whoever you want can see it, not everyone. Or maybe paid subscribers. Is yes. that what you would do if it were that could be That could be a way to do it. There's other ways, better ways to sell subscriptions, but that's one quick way. Question. So, okay, so with regard to the private site, your site is marked as private and has been <coughs> set up on WordPress two years ago. Mm -hmm. Is that pending when you're talking about longevity? Mm -hmm. Is that coming to play? That actually won't affect you because your content is still all date stamped okay. at, that, at that length of time. It's just that no one was able to see it, but the content was still there. Okay. And as you make yourself aware to the search engines, then that'll help you because it's been there. So then you could you could basically move over from one to, to the to the more public site. Definitely, you have always this control to make these changes, and it's very it's pretty seamless. This option next is turned on by default, and I really like it. But we're going to alter it a little bit. Related posts. How many times have you visited some website? You followed a link. You read the website. You read that blog post, and you saw enticements of some other posts near it that make you want to read more. Most of the time that happens. You finish an article, you want to read another one. You finish that one, maybe one more, and suddenly it's midnight. So we want that for our site, and it's on by default. Show related content after posts. So when someone reads that one post, it'll link to other related posts. How are they related? We'll see with categories and tags and such. But we get that by default. And then we get here, show related header to make it more clearly separate. You can turn that on or off to make it more seamless. I myself prefer that it's that this preview is on. I, I kind of don't like to be tricked when I'm reading something and then suddenly another article appears without me knowing what I was reading. I hate that over on the Motley Fool website. 
um, investing sites, but I would recommend you leave it on. And I don't think there's a detriment to your SEO from what I've read. What I would recommend to make a change here is turn on use a large and visually striking layout. Turn that one on. <coughs> because without it, it kind of looks like a plain old ad that we're getting accustomed to ignoring. So if you activate use a picture, basically, it takes a picture from your blog post itself and shows it to, to you, and that could catch people's attention. We'll talk about eye-catching photos and all of that, but I like that and I recommend that. So they'll see a section on related, they'll see an interesting picture, they'll click to read more, thus staying on your site longer and accomplishing the goal. Be it to subscribe to your site, buy your product, donate to your charity, get volunteers, whatever you're trying to do on your site. The longer you keep them there, the more chance there is they accomplish that goal. When you show the random uh, competitors, is that something that uh, some algorithm puts it in there, or do you have to put in hypertext for related articles or related information? It does it for you. All you have to do is turn it on, and it does it for you. Now this, I don't know why they put it so far down here, because this to infinity and beyond is related to blog pages show at most. Um, the traditional kind of blog is that you read three or four or five posts, or you see them, and then there's page two, page three, page four. A modern variation, which is gaining some popularity, is the infinite scroll. Have you seen websites where you get to the end of the screen, but then more appears automatically? You get to the end of that, and more appears automatically. That's the infinite scroll. So it's on by default. So in a sense, this overrides the other one. I don't know why they have them separate. I don't know why this one is all the way down here, and this one up here. This is, this is going to be ignored. Because down here it says show seven at a time. You can't change that. But it's either use infinite scroll or not. It depends on what your theme is. It depends on your theme also, yes. Uh, some allow you to keep scrolling, some force the next button, and so forth. What do you recommend? Yeah. That they're telling you this or that? Mm -hmm. It depends on what your theme is. So if you change themes, it'll change what that says there. Oh, this number here? Uh huh. Oh, okay. And you what it says. Like on mine says, we've changed this option to a quick scroll version since you have a footer widgets and appearance. Huh, widgets. okay. Or your theme uses click to scroll with the default behavior. Okay, so this is the this is the generic one that I often see because I often choose a generic theme. But when people choose different themes, they get different options. That's interesting. So choose whichever options you like. Um, which is one override the other? What do you recommend? So the one that would be better doesn't really matter for SEO. What would matter for you to think about is for your readers. If your readers are a demographic that would get confused by this infinite scroll or annoyed, turn it off. If your readers like to just keep reading and reading content, turn it on. So for SEO, there's no difference because it's not that it's going to load all your every single one of your blog posts. It'll it'll load some amount of them, so it won't slow your site. It's just about the temperament of your readers for you to choose what you like. But it's overriding the other, so you choose, when you choose one or the other? Mm -hmm. Because you've already chosen the before up in the other section. That's right, so... Can you so, go back and change that? Sure. You can go back and change it to whichever you'd like. You just need to decide which would work better for your, for your readers. This enhanced feeds, don't worry about it. It's a little advanced and not really necessary. That's why it's off. So don't worry about enhanced feeds. We have follower settings, show follow button to logged out users. This is an example of decreasing user friction. You hear that term friction, which is just a fancy way of saying user annoyance. So the more a user is annoyed at something, the li less likely they will accomplish something. Have you gone to a website, you read an article, let's say you want to add a comment because you've got an amazing comment to add and before you can add the comment it says register please so okay that's a little annoying but I'll register 
Then it says, please visit your inbox to, to confirm your subscription. By that time, I'm getting more annoyed. I go over to my inbox, because it's a really good comment. I follow the link, and there's some problem still. Like, forget it. And I don't comment, and I don't come back. That was a lot of friction right there. It caused me to give up and not do what they wanted me to do. So this is one place where we can decrease user friction, and it's on by default. Show follow button to logged out users. So I want people to follow my blog, to subscribe to my blog. So I'm going to have a button show up that says follow this blog. If I don't turn that on, I'm going to have to figure a way to activate a button elsewhere to have people subscribe, to follow. So if I leave this on, it makes it a little easier for people to follow my blog, to subscribe to my blog, decreasing user friction. So let's leave it on. When they subscribe, when they follow, they'll get one of two messages. People can choose to subscribe to your whole blog or to individual posts, comments, and such. These are the messages that go out automatically when they do either when they follow your blog or when they follow a comment, a post. The default is fine, but if you don't like the corniness of it, you can change it. There's no nothing really I can say what to change it to. This really depends on the character of your blog. Is it a professional financial blog, then Howdy might not quite work. But if it is, uh, you know, a down-home personal cooking blog, great. Howdy works. Change it to whatever you want. This is really thinking about in terms of what would your users expect to see here. And a lot of the modern sites are kind of like in a very friendly uh, vernacular and they use slang and friendly terms and such. Maybe you want to do that, maybe not. Doesn't matter for SEO. It's for about your users. What would they expect to see or, or care about your character? Any changes that you made here, then go ahead and save changes. There's two more settings I'd like to show. Very important one. Let's go to discussion. Discussion settings. There's many factors that are important for a website to get traffic. Um, one of the factors is the ability for people to comment on your posts. So if the search engines see that people are commenting on your posts, that it's a lively website, it's a lively blog, that could help you rank better than your competitors. The downside of that is that if anyone is able to post what they want, then anyone will post what they want. Positive, negative, controversial, off-topic, trolling, spam. So we have an option to turn on here to protect us against that. I'm going to skip a little bit and I'll come back. It's If you scroll down to a section that is called Before a Comment Appears, it's not on, you want to turn on. Comment must be manually approved. So in theory, right now we've got the door wide open. Anyone can walk in and write what they want in the guest book or the wall. So if you turn that on, you will get an email at the account that you set up earlier, that you specified earlier, you get an email. This is a new comment with a little preview of it and who wrote it. And right in the email, it'll say approve, deny, spam. So if you read that and see that's a good comment, approve it. it. Shows up on the site. It's perhaps the user that wrote it has written before, but for some reason they were really abrasive or mean or off topic. You can click deny, it won't show up. And then if it's spam, if it gets through the filter, you can click spam, and then that will be filtered out and it'll never show up again. So that's the downside of having comments on your site. You've now got to be a moderator. And maybe you've already got your hands full running the business, taking the orders, writing the blog, and now you've got to deal with people's comments. The built-in filtration system is pretty good, but sometimes things slip through. If they slip through, we've got that other safety net right there. Comment must be manually approved. 
and I recommend that. Definitely. This is your blog, your content, basically your property. You can delete any negative comment that slips through, any off-topic comment, it's not a problem. There's no issue about infringing on someone's free speech and such because it's your blog, it's your property. If you've got in the real world someone yelling at you on your front porch, you can tell them to get off your property. You can tell them, get on the street, get off my property, have the cops deal with you. Same thing here. This is your front porch. This is your property. If you have people coming to your blog and writing stupid negative things, delete it. No problem. It's your property. So if you have this option, their negative comments will never show up until you approve. Coupled with Akismet anti-spam strictness, this little filter thing is strict. Silently discard the worst and most pervasive spam. So that's another safety net that keeps the bad comments out. And that one, at least, is on by default. So those are the two big things to activate on this screen. It'll keep your blog running well and help your SEO. Just briefly, if we back up to the top, All of these that are on are good. Leave them on. I won't go into detail, but they're good. Uh, your site can link to another site, and there will be a connection. We want that, so they're all, they're all good. These settings over here, uh, these are all good as well. This one, uh, you can decide about having people register for first or not, but again, that's the user friction. <coughs> If you turn this on and then a person has to take their time first to register, it might not result in much, many comments. So all of these defaults here are also good. Do you want an email when someone comments? Yes, I want to moderate it. Do you want an email when someone reblogs or shares my post? Yeah, I want to know about that or not. You can turn those on or off. Whatever it is right now is good because then that also helps you uh, prevent some of that spam. That's just personal preference. There's uh, some sites where the newest comment is right at the top, so you see the last, yeah, the last so word. It's really uh, up to you how you would like to present the content of your site. So there's no benefit or negative to changing either one. It's just about how you would like to display your items on your site. Well, I mean, I'm talking about the, the bottom line. It says comments should be displayed with the older comments at the top. And, and wouldn't it be the newest comments on the top and the older? Because the older ones would be out of date, right? Up to you. I don't know. Well, I mean, what do you think? As I said, I don't think there's too much of a benefit. It really depends on how you want to present it to your to your users. We have comment moderation. Um, this is uh, to restrict people that have spammed your site and such. Uh, if you need to do that, you can go into these screens. It's pretty self-explanatory. So everything else here. I'm just going to skip for the moment. Uh, everything looks good. One little thing at the very bottom, there's no positive or negative, but again, to give your site a little more character than everyone else's, the default is that at the bottom of the blog, it'll say, leave a reply. Maybe you want to write something else. And again, it doesn't matter what you write. It's not going to affect your SEO, really. But if you have something like, got something to say, you know, you're giving a different personality to that instead of everyone else's leave a reply. So if you'd like to change that, you can at the very bottom, and then click Save Changes. We'll look at one last screen, then we'll take a break. This goes on to the idea of, uh, uh, unfortunately, it's not true. Uh, if you build it, they will not come. 
they need to know about it. They need to know to come to your blog to read your blog. You can't just build a blog and start to publish and you'll get found eventually by the search engines, but you'll get found faster with other techniques we'll talk about. So, we've got a section here we want to look at. Sharing. Under settings, go to sharing. We've got this top section called publicize. This is very cool because you're going to publish something on your blog post and ideally you want to go you want to go to settings you want to go to settings and then share it's at the very bottom of the screen so once you come over to settings and then under sharing and you publicize here you have a website but you also have Facebook hopefully and you have Twitter hopefully you have these other social media you want to publish your content to those as well you publish something and then you forget oh I forgot to share it on Facebook that's why I'm not getting any traffic you forgot to put it on LinkedIn that's why I'm not getting any traffic well if you connect your blog to these different networks here they'll automatically go to those networks once you click publish so you're publicizing your blog post to the other platforms that way, if you forget to ever log in, it did it for you. We're not going to do it together because you will need to log in with your Google Plus or your Tumblr or LinkedIn or whatever. But it's just a matter of connecting and then approving the connection. And then when we actually publish a post, we'll see the button that says Publish to LinkedIn. And it'll go automatically as soon as you publish it. So as I showed with the other examples of the clients, you should make it easy for people that visit the blog to easily then share to their Twitter or their LinkedIn or their Facebook friends. And that's this section here. It's a little confusing. We've got a section of available services, enabled services, and what does it look like? So right now, on any blog posts we publish, it's going to say, share this and it's got these four networks we have these to choose from email print LinkedIn etc and these are the ones that are active you can drag and drop to rearrange let's say I want Facebook first so you just drag it to the left and then Facebook will be the first thing that people can share on let's say I want Facebook and Twitter but I don't want this press this one so you can return it back to the top and you don't want Google Plus you can return it back to the top so now your blog posts have a quick way to share on Facebook or Twitter <coughs> those are not the only two social networks Pinterest is also popular so I want Pinterest but maybe I don't want Pinterest and the other ones to show up right away. If you drag it to the gray area over here, I'm going to drag Pinterest to the gray area right there, now people will see Facebook, Twitter, and more. And the rest will then pop up. So you could put in all of these other ones there, just in case someone's on Tumblr or Pocket, whatever that is, or Reddit, whatever that is, giving people the ability to share to what they're, what they like. And so it's going to look like that. Facebook, Twitter, and more. Why do you hide them? To hide them, you have to drag them back to the top. I mean, why? Is this yeah, the the director will be hidden behind the show. Yeah, they'll be hidden behind this, this more button. Oh, okay. I guess, I guess it's a matter of like what, what would be the benefit of hiding them. So that your screen is not so cluttered. If you put all seven or ten of them, you're going to have all those buttons on your blog, every single blog post, and it might look a little cluttered. So you could put it here, maybe you want to direct more traffic to these. Maybe you don't even have a Twitter. Um, but this is for people to share on their own networks. That's what that looks like. But you have a few button styles. Right now, here under button style, it says icon and text. You can have only the icon. It'll look something like that. That might look nice. 
you can have text, I think that's really boring, but you can have text, and then you can have the official button, which will look like the official button and actually also have a counter of the activity. That's good and bad. Popularity breeds popularity on social networks online. So if people visit your blog and it's and they see you, it's got 41 likes, it's got 12 tweets, it's got whatever, they are more enticed themselves to share. Conversely, if your blog posts have 000, people will say, this is not a very good blog, no one cares. So they won't share. So perhaps until you build an audience, you could have one of the other ones, like the icon, like that, and then as you get activity, then you change it to the official buttons and you'll see That'll then give you the popularity, breeding popularity. And the text that appears is share this. You can make it say share, or enjoy, or spread the love, or whatever. Share. Would you like these share buttons to appear on your posts, and your pages, and your media, and your front page? We'll go into detail what's the difference between a post and a page. But front page should make sense, and media are all your pictures. For the moment, I'm going to recommend to only leave it on posts, because I'll explain what the difference between posts and pages are a little later. If you don't change that like this, it shouldn't be a problem, but I'm going to recommend that, and I'll explain why a little later once I talk about the difference. How many of you uh, have a Twitter account? Raise your hand. How many of you have a Twitter account for your business? All right, so if you've got a Twitter account for your business, you can add your Twitter address right there. So when someone shares your post on their Twitter, it will automatically tag your address on their tweet. It doesn't have to be your business, but I'm just saying, if you put in your Twitter name there, it'll show up automatically when someone tweets your post. WordPress.com itself is also kind of experimenting with a social network feature in that you can like people's comments and share and stuff within WordPress.com and so it's on by default let people like your stuff on WordPress.com. That's a different like than a Facebook like. And there's no harm in letting leaving that on. We want to get more activity and fame through the social network, so we'll leave it on. Speaking of fame and activity, again, we don't want to be a dead end. I'm going to post something, but I want it to be shared, spread. So by default, we have the ability for people to reblog you, which is basically copying a portion of your blog so that they share it on your site. If that sounds horrible, turn it off. But one reason why you might want that on, again, is for your content to spread out to more eyes, more eyeballs, more subscribers. That's up to you to decide what you would like. I can't tell you what's better for you. But there's the aspect of social in social media, sharing, collaborating, all of that, you have to, if you don't know it by now, you have to be comfortable with the fact that anything you put on the internet, on the web, is probably going to be there forever. So just because you deleted it on your own page doesn't mean there's a copy elsewhere. And there are websites that operate 24 hours a day making, webs making copies of websites, for better or for worse. So you have to come to grips, come to terms with, and accept. Whatever you put online will probably stay online, even if you try to delete it, even if you get your lawyers and all of that, because a file can be copied easily, a page can be copied easily. So once you accept that, then you're going to know, then you're going to post only stuff that is professional or relevant or, you know, um, stuff you're not embarrassed about, but it might be too late for some of us. So turning that on or off is not going to prevent people that really, really, really want to copy your work. But that's in order for you to share your stuff online and get more of an audience. Yes? When someone reblogs what you've already blogged, can they edit that and change it around, or is it locked in? 
they can add sort of commentary to it, but your original content still stays in place. And then um, people can comment on your posts, and then people can like those comments. That's useful for for helping you moderate things, because if the community is kind of self-policing in that maybe a negative comment got through, but then people voted it positively, voted that one negatively, it goes away, or if they voted other ones positively, that one rises up. So that's useful to help the good comments rise to the top and the not-so-good ones not rise to the top. So let's save. Let's save that screen. And there's still plenty that we can look at and learn about WordPress. It's only a two week long class. So let's take one more break. When we come back, we'll start to develop a strategy of what to write. It's 8.43. We'll do a short break until 8.50. Eight minutes. We'll be back at 8.50. And then when we come back, we will start to brainstorm ideas for a blog.